Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar about ESG matters. HR should focus on uh, part one. My name is uh, Sophie Maas. I'm an employment lawyer and I'm a partner at the Belgium uh, law firm uh, Kleis and Engels. And it is my pleasure uh, to host today's uh, webinar about ESG. ESG stands for, as we all know, environmental, social and corporate governance. Um, and it refers to evaluating a business, not from a financial point of view, but from a environmental, social and governance uh, perspective. I think we can all agree that in the past, uh, companies could large, largely go about their business, just making profits and, profits and satisf satisfying uh, their shareholders. But today, uh, there is an increased expectations that companies should also act in, according, uh, in accordance with ESGs. And we also see, uh, and we see that from for, that they need to do that for different uh, stakeholders, be it their investors, their customers, but also their employees. And in particular, younger employees, they are very keen on working in an environment which corresponds uh, to uh, their values. And we also see that different national governments are also acting on this field. For example, also the European uh, European Union, who came out with a proposal. Uh, last uh, February on uh, corporate sustainability uh, sustainability uh, due diligence. So this is why we think that companies, they need to prepare and HR needs to consider in their HR practices uh, ESG. And that is why we use Laboris, our global alliance are here to help. And why we have with our different expert groups, we have asked some of our members of our lawyers, our members of our groups, which is uh, which are consisting of different uh, lawyers from all around the world. We have asked them several questions in relation to ESG, and I'm very happy uh, to present you the result of those uh, questions and those answers, which you can find on our Youth Laboris uh, website on our ESG page, where we have uh, collected different uh, resources in relation uh, to uh, ESG in the context of uh, HR. And today's webinar, the purpose is to discuss uh, with the shares of our expert groups the results or, or the common conclusions uh, that they have drawn uh, based on the surveys that they have uh, done uh, with their members. And today is part one. So I'm very happy to uh, present you our today panel. So first of all, we have Emanuela uh, from our Italian office, uh, Toffoletto. She is the chair of the Compensation and Benefits uh, Group, and she had a look at whether we should include in bonus plans ESG uh, targets as uh, performance uh, indicators. Um, then we also have Alexander. Alexander is uh, from our German uh, office, uh, Klimt, he is, shares the individual employment rights uh, group and he has examined whether ESG considerations will have an impact on individual employment policies. Then we also have Stefano, also from Italy. Stefano shares our OHS uh, group and he has examined uh, whether companies should check um, whether um, their uh, suppliers uh, comply with OHS uh, standards or what they do in relation to uh, OHS. And then myself, I'm heading uh, the uh, Immigration and Global Mobility Group, and we have examined our group whether companies have um, uh, have a social dumping legislation and whether local companies can be liable if their subcontractors do not uh, comply with minimum terms and conditions or immigration laws. So that's a bit in a nutshell what we will discuss today. In a second part, we will have a look at our other uh, expert groups and with the chair of those expert groups, we will discuss topics like data privacy, uh, diversity, supply chains, uh, etc., and also co-determination. So I'm very uh, also welcome you to join our next webinar, which will take place on the 17th uh, of May. But let's start with uh, today's webinar. So I'm first going to ask you, Emanuela, uh, you had a look at uh, whether we should include in bonus plans ESG uh, factors or indicators. So can you give us a bit uh, a conclusion of your survey uh, with your uh, members? Thank you, Sophie. 
And uh, I'm uh, happy uh, to say that uh, our survey shows clearly that the direction taken by the various decision makers across the world is absolutely uh, unique. Indeed, the, the common trend from Aust Austria, Australia up to South America is to encourage uh, the spread of uh, ESG values, uh, also by including them uh, among the KPIs uh, for our bonus uh, in uh, in the bonus plan and bonus scheme, I remember for that KPIs uh, stays for a key performance indicators. So the common standard is that uh, the um, ESG themed uh, KPIs are not mandatory by law, but uh, according to the, the result of the survey in, in, um, in more than 26 countries, uh, it seems that the tendency, as I said, is absolutely clear in saying that it is absolutely advisable to include them in the bonus scheme. To, so to include KPI as KPI, uh, to use KPIs as an indicator for bonus scheme long term and uh, uh, short term one. Um, having said that, uh, it should be uh, also uh, worth noticing that strict, stricter provisions referring to the implementation of uh, ESG remuneration policies are usually provided for specific kind of company. In a nutshell, for example, in Italy and in Croatia, listed companies are required by law to set out their remuneration policy in contribution to pursue the sustainability of the company. In addition, um, in uh, other European countries, uh, such as France uh, and Austria, large corporations, that means corporations with more than 500 employees, uh, are required to provide annual non-financial statement uh, about uh, their um, impact on environmental, social, and um, employee matters. And uh, I mean, as uh, you said, uh, this is not unexpected because uh, the EU regulation specifically requires that certain large companies uh, um, have to disclose information on the way they operate and manage social and environmental challenges. Um, another interesting point uh, is that uh, according to European regulation on sustainability related disclosure in the financial se sector, uh, states that financial uh, market participants and financial advisors must include information in their remuneration policies on how those policies are consistent with the integration of sustainability risk. So, therefore, according to the EU, including ESG indicators as KPI in bonus plan and bonus scheme may be a way to comply with these reporting requirements. As I said, this is not a trend uh, affecting only European countries, but it's a common trend also outside the EU. For example, in, uh, during 2021, both in the UK and the US, additional disclosure obligation on ESG metrics have been introduced. Finally, considering that we have very few minutes at our disposal, I would like to point out that ESG is not only dedicated to intangible long-term goals and to environmental protection, because a correct application of the ESG philosophy is the one that embraces not only safeguard of the working environment as a whole. And uh, uh, therefore, for example, to give you an example, in Greece, um, uh, has been uh, introduced a recent piece, uh, piece of legislation uh, uh, which states that uh, employers have an obligation to drown up anti-violence and anti-harassment policy to assist competent bodies in investigating worse cursor complaints in the event of such an incident. Therefore, it seems that now includes, uh, for example, as a KPI, uh, as an index, the reduction in the number of those uh, incidents uh, as a KPI could constitute an ESG indicator effective bonuses. Uh, finally, um, I have to also point out that a great part of listed companies um, all over the world has included the employee satisfaction and commitment as an ESG KPI. And, but those are only example of possible ESG KPIs. And if we have uh, time a little bit later, we can discuss this uh, a little bit more in details. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Emanuela. Very uh, interesting. 
Um, then I'm now going to Alexander. Alexander, you have been looking at whether ESG considerations will have an impact on employment policy. So what are your conclusions after your survey? Thanks, Sophie. Thanks a lot. Um, we have received in total feedback from 21 countries. And as a conclusion from the vast majority of the countries, we received the answer that ESG will change company policies, such as code of ethics, company travel policies, and much more. But let me go a bit into further detail, as we do not have a complete uniform picture. Let me start with South America and here Argentina. Here we learn that ESG is not having the importance that it should have, as, as in other countries, due to the economic crisis, um, that uh, uh, local Argentine companies are still worried about surviving and moving forward. Nevertheless, this picture changes if we deal with international companies having subsidiaries in Argentina. The situation in Brazil is a bit different. We were informed that company policies have a key role with regard to ESG, as a sustainable company cannot tolerate corruption, bribery, anti-competitive practices, discrimination, harassment, or illegal activity. In such regard, the Code of Ethics seems to be the primary piece of the company's internal policies to incorporate the ESG rules as it provides for norms of social behavior. And in Chile, we see that it is very likely that ESG factors would be implemented in the company's policies to boost employee motivation to perform better and uplift their productivity, attract talent through greater social credibility. But here we still speak about will be reflected. On the other hand, for example, in Australia, we see that most public companies already have adopted policies reflecting ESG principles, for example, in the area of diversity. Listed and unlisted companies alike are increasingly focused on ensuring that their policies reflect the evolving expectations of investors and regulators and are increasingly likely to amend existing policies or introduce new policies to address ESG issues. Companies are likely to introduce or amend ethical sourcing policies and human rights policies. This is a result of Australian modern slavery reporting requirements and a growing international movement towards mandatory supply chain and human rights due diligence. These policies will reflect the company's commitment to meeting their obligations and ethical responsibilities and are likely to include supplier minimum standards with which suppliers will be required to comply. From Kazakhstan, for example, we received the feedback that ESG standards are applied primarily to activities of international companies and major national companies focused on the attraction of foreign investment. These companies currently themselves determine the ESG requirements to comply with. In general, the European countries share the opinion that ESG will change the company policies although a few countries report that they have not seen examples yet. But the majority of the country says that ESG no longer is a nice to have, but a must have, especially the corporate sustainability reporting directive will strengthen the importance of ESG in Europe. And in Finland, for example, we see that Finnish employers already integrate ESG goals into their policies. The same applies in other countries such as Greece and Germany, whereby in Greece, this only concerns the larger international corporations. In Estonia, we even hear the clear answer that ESG needs to be embedded holistically in the DNA of a business. And one way to do this is through policies. Another interesting example is France. In France, we already see corresponding legislation resulting in a first step from the law to fight climate change. And it is very interesting, in addition, that this law strengthens already the Works Council's power on the environmental aspects. The Works Council consultation must include the environmental aspects, especially for projects. On the other hand, for example, in Poland, ESG is not yet introduced in Polish law. Polish companies very often adopt global policies such as code of ethics or company travel policies. So only in case ESG affects their content globally, it also affects companies and employees in Poland. Concluding, we forecast that ESG will be reflected in company policies. For example, in business related travel policies, these will definitely change. Traditionally, the primary focus of travel programs has been cost control, gaining greater visibility into spending practices and finding ways how to organize corporate travel more efficiently. Now we are seeing a lot of corporations reflecting and rethinking 
how they want to reinstate their travel policies. Companies are increasingly calculating sustainability tools to compare the environmental costs of their travel choices. So policies will reflect this. And for example, air travel will probably greatly re be reduced and only per not permitted with carbon dioxide compensation. Other areas that policies will regulate will probably be recycling, energy saving, sometimes we call it green office, becoming climate positive, zero paper policies. Also, code of assets will reflect ESG. The use of social media will reflect ESG principles. And finally, supply chain management policies will change with the aim to behave ethically in supply chain management issues. In other words, we also assume that increasing liability, including for subcontractors, could mean that certain suppliers and service providers can no longer be included in the selection process by the company in the future. In general, we expect policies to be defined in which the employee is obliged to assist the employer to comply with new increased standards of corporate governance. And the last point, from nearly all of the countries, we got the feedback that we strongly believe that implementing the just mentioned ESG goals in policies will have a very strong impact attracting talent through greater social credibility. Yes, uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, I have seen that there is a question with uh, asking where they can, where people can find the result of our surveys. Well, actually, it is on our website, our Youth Laboris website, and I think the central team has just sent the link as well. If you go to our ESG page, you will find there the survey with our questions, and you need to look at the country, and then you you find per country uh, the relevant answer. I saw another question as well, but I, we will take questions. Uh, at the end. So now, Stefano, I'm uh, coming to you. Um, you had a look at health and safety and uh, whether companies should check the health and safety measures applied by their suppliers. Hi, Sophie, and thank you for your introduction. Yes, in our expert group, we analyzed whether or not there are any laws, regulations, or also guidelines that require companies to check the standards of health and safety measures adopted uh, by, by companies of their supply chains. And what we have discovered is that while at the moment in most countries there is no general obligation to carry out a specific supply chain due diligence concerning the respect of minimum health and safety standards, at the same time, from most countries, we received the answer that there is starting to be a focus on this issue and several of our partner firms are suggesting their client companies to start to be prepared to comply with expected increasing regulation in, in this sector. More in detail, um, we can say that there are some countries such as, for example, um, Kazakhstan, Denmark, Latvia, Mexico, in which basically at the moment there is absolutely no regulation at all in, in, in this field. Also in Finland at the moment there is no specific provision in such sense, but it's one of the countries in which we have, we have told that there are uh, some preliminary preparations being done for drafting a, a national ESG law, which would likely also include HNS aspects connected to, to supply chains. And uh, also, as Alex was saying before, uh, from Finland, we received the, the same answer, and which is that um, many organizations, although there is no specific obligation in such sense, have already started to take actions, enhancing uh, self-enhancing responsibilities in their own codes of conduct. Then there are several, there are several other countries, such as Hungary, Italy, Brazil, Belgium, Chile, and Korea, among the others, in which there are indeed some specific uh, health and safety obligations with reference to companies involved in the supply chain, but only in the case in which the services are carried out on site, so on the principal side. In these countries, there are some relevant distinctions among uh, the, the different jurisdictions. Um, but the, the, the main theme is that in those in those countries there are uh, there is some sort of uh, obligations towards the employees of the of the contractors and subcontractors as well as some kind of joint 
liabilities in case of accidents happening in, um, in the workplace. For example, in Italy, um, if the service is carried out at the, at the principal's premises or in, in any other location which falls under the principal's control, then the principal must respect several obligations, uh, such as, for example, assessing together with the contractor if there are any specific risks connected to the interference among their activities. And moreover, in the event of accidents, with some exclusions in some cases, but the principal may be held jointly liable with the contractor or, or subcontractor which employs the, the harmed employees. There are also other countries in which regulations concerning uh, health and safety in the supply chains do apply, but only under specific circumstances or, or in certain specific sectors. For example, in Sweden and in Estonia, there are specific regulations, but always connected to the health and safety obligations in the supply chain. But such regulations only apply in the uh, construction sector. In other countries, for example, as, uh, as it may be the case of Netherlands and Greece, there are specific provisions, but only with reference to uh, the transport sector, for example, or uh, some activities carried out in distribution centers. Uh, what, what I find, what, what we discovered to be the most interesting situation is the one in, um, in Germany, in which um, there, a law has already been approved, which will come in force on um, January 1, 2023. It is a law on corporate due diligence to prevent human rights violations in supply chains. Uh, and as, as I was saying, it will come into effect next January. And the law imposes on companies several obligations concerning the management of their supply chains. And such obligations include the one to carry out, to carry out specific due diligence on the occupational health and safety standards. These provisions will apply to companies with more than 3,000 employees, so only for, for big companies starting from next year, and to companies with more than 1,000 employees starting from January 1, 2024. And what is interesting in, is that it will be applicable to both service and manufacturing supply chains. Failure to, to, com to comply with the obligations uh, set forth therein may result in relevant fines up to 2% of the average turnover and or in the exclusion from procurement processes. So basically, what we, what we found out from our analysis is that although there is not uh, at a general, from a general standpoint, uh, there is no um, general regulation of, of the of these aspects so of the of the any obligations to to verify and to check the respect of health and safety standards standards and, and supply chain there is a, an increasing uh, going back to what i uh, what i said at the very beginning there is a, an increasing interest and attention in this area and many uh, member firms are, are advising their clients to start to take into account these issues on which they're expecting upcoming uh, regulation. Okay, thank you, uh, Stefano. Looking at the time, I will quickly uh, go to the next topic, which was uh, global mobility and immigration. Um, we had responses from 20 countries and we had a look more like, how is the legal framework today? Uh, do your do your country has it or are there any laws in place to fight against uh, social dumping and uh, if that is the case can you as a local company be liable liable if your foreign subcontractor posts its employees to your country and does not comply with minimum terms and conditions or immigration laws um, not surprisingly in the EU yes we do have uh, laws in place to fight against social dumping because we have a European uh, framework for that, the Posted Workers Directive, which uh, says that if you post employees to another country, that then you should at least comply with a minimum terms and conditions uh, of the host country, and they relate to minimum
minimum salary uh, to working time, health and safety, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now as a result of the revised posted workers directive of 2018, since 2020, after 12 months, all uh, mandatory employment clause of the host country even apply um, after uh, 12 months with some uh, few exceptions, but a lot of legislation, local legislation will apply. So that is a bit the framework that is currently in Europe in place to fight against social dumping. But then the next question is, if I'm a local company and I have a subcontractor who posts its employees to my company, he does not respect with all those minimum terms and conditions. Can I be liable if my subcontractors do not comply with those rules or do not um, um, or employ employees uh, illegally in the country? And there we see that the responses are more diverse uh, and we have different ranges of liabilities uh, in place. So first of all, we have a range of countries that uh, recognize the concept of prohibited lease of personnel and say that if there is prohibited lease uh, of personnel because your local company actually handles as of this employee is your own employee. Well, there is a presumption that there is an employment contract and you are just completely liable for everything. And that's, for example, the case in my country, Belgium, but also in uh, Croatia. Also, Italy responded in that way. And also Switzerland, although this is outside the EU, but the, the rules are quite uh, similar. Then we had other countries responding. Yes, we have liabilities in place, but for the example, uh, for uh, payment if the salaries are not correctly paid and it can be minimum wages uh, so liability uh, for minimum uh, wages or for just the actual wage but there we see differences compared to the sectors there are countries saying that it applies to all sectors like in Italy Germany and in the Netherlands but you have also other countries saying that no it's only in the construction uh, sector that we have that for example that was the case in Estonia and in Croatia and then you have other countries like mine saying it is to a limited number of sectors where we see that there is an increased risk of fraud and only in those sectors we have uh, those joint uh, liability rules for payments of salaries uh, in place. Another common thing in Europe is liability, joint liability, if your subcontractor employs illegal uh, employees, so without the necessary work permits, etc. There we have seen a lot of countries responding, yes, you company, local company, if you're aware of that, you can be liable both for criminal penalties and also for uh, payment of salaries. It's again, uh, it's the case in, in, in Belgium, it's the case in Luxembourg, in Germany, in Italy, in Croatia uh, and uh, so forth. And then a last thing where we also have a lot of joint liability uh, uh, is because in most cases, if companies in Europe post uh, employees to another country, they have to do a posting declaration in the host country. And there are also user companies, they should check whether uh, that uh, has been made. And if that is not the case, they should do it themselves. Also, there are a lot of countries responded that if you as a local company, you don't check this and they do not and, and the employer has not made uh, the uh, declarations that uh, you are liable for all the penalties uh, as well. So that's a bit the picture in Europe. If we then go outside Europe, uh, for example, you have countries like Argentina and uh, Chile who responded that you as a, a local company must check if uh, your subcontractor pays the salaries, pays social security and even need to ask proof of it. And if you don't do that and you don't do that at regular periods in time, you are liable as well if uh, your subcontractor is not uh, compliant. Um, also Mexico uh, responded that uh, you are liable if your subcontractor does not uh, or employs, for example, uh, uh, illegal employees, so does not comply with immigration laws, and also does if he does not comply with uh, laws in relation to application of labor laws. Uh, also, Canada reported uh, that if um, if there are uh, temporary foreign employees making use of the international mobility uh, scheme, then they are entitled to the same protections as Canadians, and the Canadian host company is also liable if those rules uh, are not uh, complied with. Um, and then lastly, the UK, uh, because that has been a long time in between, the UK reported that um, the issue of um, 
social dumping is not much discussed. They do not have really specific rules on that, but indirectly they have such rules because UK is one of those countries who now already also has a modern slavery act imposing already obligations on uh, companies to check uh, their or to do the diligence on their supply chain to uh, prevent uh, exploitation. Um, the penalties are not very significant, but it's in a very important reputational uh, issue if, if you're not compliant as an organization. But I think here also in conclusion, what we can say is that although there is not yet everywhere legislation in uh, that area, but it is increasing. And my view is, especially with the uh, in Europe, because Europe is really going forward in that direction of checking uh, your subcontractors and your supply chain. And you cannot only say, well, it's not me, it's my subcontractor. That for companies, it is really important uh, to take steps uh, and, and to, to protect uh, themselves uh, for that. That's a bit the general tendency uh, that we also, from an immigration and global mobility perspective, uh, could draw based on, on our uh, conclusions. Um, so that was in a nutshell, and I'm just in time, uh, but I'm still going to, if you permit me, ask the question, because we have a question here, and I think Emanuela, it's for you. So the question is, um, what guidance can you give to link remuneration to ESG or, or what kind of targets? I think that's, that's a question. Uh, should we include in our bonus plans? Absolutely. What we can say that is that, uh, of course, uh, um, the kind uh, of and the type of ESG matrix uh, uh, in bonus plan uh, in bonus plans uh, varies a lot uh, depending on uh, the size of the organization and the sector of the activity in which it operates. But in any case, we can say that traditional ESG KPIs. Uh, focus on health and safety, first of all, uh, issue with, which may result in material reputational damage, uh, employee engagement uh, and uh, risk. But increasingly, uh, ESG KPIs uh, cover broader issues uh, such as diversity and inclusion and environmental responsibility. An, exam an example of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion could be the number of women uh, in uh, the board of director or as in Italy as executive. But in any case, we can also say that uh, there could be a difference between uh, the KPI that you use uh, in the short term bonuses scheme and in the long term one. Because uh, in the second case, for example, normally companies uh, um, uh, make reference uh, to long-term indicat indicators such as uh, decarbonization or and uh, net zero emission commitments. So we must uh, take into consideration this kind uh, of, uh, of uh, differences. And of course, uh, the KPIs that you want to use in your bonus scheme uh, must be measurable at the end uh, of uh, the reference period in which I've been, uh, been uh, considered to. Can I just ask one additional question to Alexander? Because I think it's a really interesting question in, in, in the framework of legislation that may come up uh, in Europe, is what will be the impact of the proposed, at the moment it's proposed, eh, of the proposed corporate sustainability uh, directive uh, on uh, regarding due diligence on, on policies? What do you, because I think that is important just to plan ahead uh, to have some insights on that, Alexander. Indeed, indeed. Um, as long as or to the companies uh, which the CSRD uh, policy applies, um, as part of the CSRD reporting, um, companies must report on a variety of sustainability related circumstances to the extent necessary for an understanding, as the directive says, of the company's business and performance results position and the impact of its operation. Um, in addition to a variety of other topics, the uh, directive provides for reporting on like things like social responsibility and treatment of employees, diversity, including at management level, equal opportunities for all, including gender equality, um, equal pay for equal work, training and qualifications, and employment inclusion of people with disabilities, working conditions, including safe and acceptable um, workplaces, um, wages, social dialogue, collective bargaining, um, respect for human rights is another issue, fundamental freedoms, democratic principles and international standards, combating corruption and bribery in all business relevant facets, stakeholder information, targets for the above reporting items and procedures for achieving them. 
um, and then updating uh, progress. So reporting is required on all these matters. And in order to do this, I strongly believe um, that uh, these aspects then will also be reflected um, in the underlying uh, company policies. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see that we are at the end of our uh, webinar and our timing. I uh, don't see any other questions. So first of all, I want to thank the panel uh, for your attendance and of course everybody here uh, for coming to our webinar and listening. I hope you find it uh, interesting. I really invite you to our second part, uh, which is in um, on the 17th of May, where we will discuss uh, the outcomes of our surveys regarding the other topics. But in the meantime, you can already go on our website where you will find uh, uh, various materials regarding uh, ESG. You have it there again. You see the link. The key questions, if you go there, there a bit further after it, you find our questions and per country the responses. We also have uh, another report uh, on ESG and we continue to, to add uh, things there uh, as well. So I hope you find it interesting and I wish you a very pleasant uh, rest of the afternoon or the morning or wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye -bye. Oh, thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.